Welcome back to the Ink Sync. I am Annie. I'm Kaylee. And this is the publishing podcast for the rest of us. Hardcore rest of us today, actually, because we're Absolutely. going deep into into like the non-cool part of publishing. Oh yeah, this is like a dive. Do you want to just jump into it? Yeah. So what is book packaging? Because like obviously if you just like look that up. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> let's get what what isn't book packaging for Dude. this particular the purposes of this recording if you ever (laughs) google book packaging um what the first like nine (laughs) the first like nine things that come up are not what we're talking about (laughs) we're talking about an industry that's actually just called uh book packagers they are publishers they are publishing books but they are not publishing they're not creating art they are creating a commodity that is meant to be sold. It's kind of, so I saw it, one of the ways that I saw it really well put out was paint by numbers. It's, they're like, we have a book that needs to get written. We have an idea for a book. This marketer came up with this idea and uh, you're going to write it. Here you go. Bye. And then the person writes it or the people write it and then they put it out and that's what it is. If you've it's- ever, see, when I, okay, anecdote really quickly. It's probably boring. I might, I might cut it out. Um, when I was growing up, I was obsessed with Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. They had a TV show called Two of a Kind, mm-hmm. and that TV show had an accompanying book series called Two of a Kind. And I owned probably fifty of those books. There were so many. I'm with you on that. Yep. Who mm-hmm. wrote those books? No idea. Definitely not the person on the cover. No. That, the person, that person on the cover. If that was a real name. Yeah. The person on the cover was always the same, I want to say. Um, but the person did not. They it's, did not write those no. books. Um, the the uh, brand around the Olsen twins, um, the two of a kind brand, came up with the storylines for those books, came up with whatever cover they wanted, and then just hired out grabbed a writer and said hey write this because we don't feel like it Mm -hmm. and then they did and then tweens like me bought 50 of them um so this is clearly a functional business model and it's called book packaging uh two of a kind is not the only book series that did this uh gossip girl nancy drew uh sisterhood of the traveling pants what are some other ones um, well, one of the we were talking about Alloy is one of the big book packager uh, companies right now, um, their current name anyway. Um, so their original name, I believe, was 17th Street Productions okay. or something like that. Um, and one of their big first successes was Sweet Valley High. Sweet Valley High. That's right. And I thought it was really interesting. Did you look into the origins of Sweet Valley High? No. So one of the things that they said that they wanted, um, because they, they, they market this all out before they actually create the product. One of the things that they said that they wanted was covers that looked like their mom's romance covers or their dad's mystery covers, but that were just like YA books, basically, because they wanted kids to feel like they were buying something that their parents were buying, that they wanted them to feel like they were they were participating in an adult publishing experience. But they weren't. They were reading Sweet Valley High. No offense to Sweet Valley High. Not at all. But I think, again, Babysitter's Club, Hardy Boys, all of those series were book packages. Book package? They were books from book packagers. Yeah. So basically, it's an existing IP that they just hired out to get a stable of. And yeah. we have that. We, we were talking about this. Like, like essentially, the um, Spy, Spy Man novels. We were talking about this recently. Um sorry there are so many unfortunately that is i don't read them because i don't like them um shit it's a uh, dean not dean coons but um what's another big big like constantly turning out books james patterson james patterson yes james patterson essentially writes very few of his own books 100 so it's so you know we talked about like authors. he writes he, sorry he writes the outlines and he writes like portions of the intros so that's that's what some of these that's, that's a book a, yeah. james patterson is a book packager yeah, functionally exactly. even if he doesn't operate that way he's yeah. a book packager. it's for his own ip mm-hmm. it's not like it's one that he started writing it's one that he invented and <laughs> you were like spy man <laughs> <laughs> just, i don't you're like you know you know spy man, Annie. Spy man. <laughs> don't you remember spy man yeah that didn't help her at all james Guys, patterson james patterson um was the <laughs> 
<laughs> God dang it. Perfect. I'm glad. Um, but yeah, like, so book packaging is so interesting. I'm yeah. like looking at it and I'm like, mm, I could probably, this is essentially like writing fan fiction. Oh, for sure. Maybe this will be my side gig. <laughs> you could. I could very easily. Absolutely. Um, and but, there's no shame in it, yeah. despite what we're going to talk about later. <laughs> well, I mean, it's there's benefits and drawbacks for sure. So, like, so just historically, um, the first actual book packager in the United States was a branch of a London publisher. Okay. Um, and it was created by Paul Steiner. Great Chanticleer time. Press was the first book packager. He basically introduced it into the market. He was an immigrant um, originally born in Venice. So this article that I read this from is from a 1996 obit from the New York Times when he passed away. And um, I think Penguin, I believe, ultimately acquired Chanticleer Press. So the first book, according to Open Library from Chanticleer Press, was published in 1807. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this has been around for a while. Out. Oh yeah, so this was the first one, and then the other, like another of the really big initial book packagers that really blew up was the Stratemeyer family, the Stratemeyer Syndicate. I I put Straightmeyer Straightmeyer in my my, but Stratemeyer actually makes sense because there's an extra e in there. Yeah, there okay. and there and his fan his parents at least one of them was a German immigrant. So okay, sure. I they assumed. have extra syllables or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. We could be wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. You... You're fine. You're fine. Uh, yeah, the Stratemeyer Syndicate. Yeah, I, I, that does sound better. Okay. Um. So they they were actually like assembled and began churning out content. They were actually the ones that put out the the first four Nancy Drew novels. And the Hardy Boys. And the Hardy Boys. Yeah, yeah they wanted it to cr- have I had no idea. Yeah, that was super cool. I um, didn't realize that was in the twenties. Like isn't that so much earlier than you thought it was? It was yeah. so much earlier than I thought it was. And the initial couple books, absolutely. Yeah. And then I think they like maybe reinvented it after Mm -hmm. a while to get the fresher generations and stuff which Mm -hmm. is not like a new thing people reuse everything all the time right kids these days can't make anything new or whatever but like so it's so interesting because like they've definitely been around for a long time i had no clue about this as an industry until Mm -hmm. like we started talking about it on the show and it came up sadly both like i just said like the other uh the chanticleer had been purchased by penguin and then um the Stratemeyer Syndicate was actually purchased what by Simon and Schuster. Simon and Schuster, yeah. yeah. So I, I would say they're trying to get these IPs so they can continue to do what James Patterson is doing, which is they mm-hmm. have their own in-house IP and they probably have their own in-house ghostwriters, essentially. Yeah. So let's go through the particulars. Um, how does one create a book at a book factor? Say it's like uh, Goosebumps, which is another one. R.L. Stein's another mm-hmm. one. Um, Fear Street. Fear Street. Thank you. I knew there was another one. And I was just like, I think Goosebumps and Arl Strand are the same. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. And before you start accusing people, just because someone is prolific does not mean that they are a pseudonym or Tamora anything like Pierce that. Tamora Pierce turns, especially back when she was like younger, she was turning out quartets like at the drop of a hat. So is King. So is Sanderson. Like I'm, Diane Duane. You know, yeah. Like so 100%. I don't want to. I don't want to give the impression. Just to be clear, that prolific authors are faking it. But I do want to say that a lot of if it seems fake formulaic, authors are prolific. Yeah. <laughs> if it seems formulaic, then probably. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Again, things like Goosebumps. So it's say you know. We want to make a new Goosebumps book. We work at a book packager. I don't remember which book packager publishes the Goosebumps, but I don't remember they're still being published. I didn't. I should have looked that up before I decided. They're making use movies. This as an with, example. <laughs> they're making movies with Jack Black in them. I'm sure they are. True. True. So um, this is happening. What do what What do we do? You're the CEO, Kaylee. What do you do? Um, so instead of using a traditional authorial setup, you uh, lean on film for some reason and you instead workshop the idea, the characters, the plot. So you get all of these pieces assembled in a committee, essentially, a writer's room. Like a boardroom yeah. or a writer's room. Yeah. yeah. But you're not actually getting the writing done in that room. No. Just the ideas. The ideas. And then you negotiate with essentially with freelancers. Um, and you might grab one that you worked with before. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and you'll pay either a flat rate, a percentage, depending on what you're negotiating with that writer. They, so you've basically done the heavy lifting as far as the idea, but then to get the words onto the paper. And you might ask them to write some sample pages, concept ideas or whatever, and pay for those, however that shakes out, and then go from there. Yeah. I think Patterson will himself come up with an outline and then maybe one or two pages of how he wants the vibe to go. And then he'll just hand it off to one of his... 
other writers for sure. Yep. So it's just some version of that for pretty much every single pack. And that's how it works. Like, and I don't want to say that kids have bad taste, but I definitely didn't care as much that my two of a kind books were very, very, very formulaic as I was growing up. When we were kids, we wanted to see kids being awesome and doing adult things safely and like winning over the grownups. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the formula we wanted. All of our stuff's formulaic. It's just a matter of how, I guess, sophisticated the formula is. Our genres in general have a formula usually. Um, Crime dramas. Mm Mm-hmm. The rom coms, like we talked about on our one of our last episodes, mm-hmm. um, so and this episode as well, and this episode. Or, oh, sorry, yes, you're right. Last episode, sorry, was, behind the curtain, was, we've been recording for three hours. I was trying, Annie. I was trying. <laughs> you're, good, you're good. Um, yeah. So, like, there's definitely like, can be it makes sense, you know, why we're how we got here, that kind mm-hmm. of deal. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's how where I was going to land on that thought originally, but that's <laughs> my sense. I'm sorry, left. and so now I'm. This is where I landed. That's my fault. That's okay. So yeah, it's um it's interesting. Also, like again, <laughs> trying to look up information on book packaging, you're gonna get a lot of information about actual packaging, and you're also gonna get information about like book binding. Um, another term for book packaging, which was also no help, is book producing. Um, and you're just gonna find it's just how publishing works and things from publishers and. <laughs> Very difficult. I my um, targeted ads have been like very cardboard box heavy for the past <laughs> couple <of> days. Right? <laughs> oh my god! So I will say that. Um, so we we actually did talk about this a little bit ago in one of our episodes. I don't know if it ever made it to the floor, out off the floor, but like, um, there was fifteen twenty years ago a you know a student that got a really massive advance, like a kid under under eighteen, and then it turned out she was a plagiarist. That she had mm. copied some of her content Mm -hmm. well she actually got her advance through a book packager they worked with her pretty sure alloy Mm -hmm. actually um and the reason i know that is because initially two of the only actual links i could find when i was trying to find information on this topic were like archived like articles about this from 2006 and 2007 so from slate and from the Herald Tribune, the International Herald Tribune. Um, but yeah, so they're talking just about like how book packaging works in general and like the author. And so like the reason book packaging works is because you don't own your ideas because they're not your ideas. The negative aspect behind if you're not careful, as with any industry that requires contracts, is predatory contracts exist and predatory people exist. And that was one of the biggest kind of cons that I observed is just because of it is a kind of a freelance a gig is that, you know, you do need contracts to protect you. And if you don't know or you have a bad agent, you could get a really bad term on your contract. That's kind of the potential negative aspect there. But as far as like the positives, I mean, like, if you're trying to start out, you want to get connections, you want to just get practice, um, all of that, like, those are really good options. I read a funny, uh, this was one of the older ones as well. Um, this guy was gonna write for a book packager, and they were like, we need like a, a wizard story, pitch us. And he's like, I don't know, wizard chef. Um, and so like, they worked it through and he, he wrote up like 20 pages as a sample or whatever they had asked for and sent it off. It was for kids. And he thought they were going to like go through and like remove the content that was inappropriate for minors, but they just gave it to the president's eight year old son. And he had some naughty language in there. And it made the kid cry. And then they just said, well, thank you, but no thank you. But he had $10,000 from the experience so that's oh my god and it made i laughed when i read that i was just like of of, of course that's incredible was this like what kind of <laughs> child's novel about wizarding chefs imagine required the aggressive amount of cursing that could make an eight-year-old cry imagine your claim to fame being i wrote about wizard chefs and made a child cry <laughs> hilarious so that was that was an article by john barlow that was that was originally published in slate that has been archived so i'll I'll present the archived links because again these yeah. are like 15 years old and yeah, thank we'll god the way back exists yeah but it just made me <laughs> laugh so i had to share that with That's you fantastic thank you for finding that yeah. that makes me happy lesson learned oh my yeah. gosh next time they're not going to do any editing so let's just take <laughs> I will say Just that don't call an eight year old a cocksucker. Yeah, like no, don't, don't tell a kid they're a bastard, a bastard, <laughs> oh my God, son of a whore amazing. or something. I don't know what on earth. He- or he had like some weird gory scene where like the dragon ate the dude or something. Yeah, <laughs> like, like no, the dude. This is the wrong kind of cooking. Ah. <laughs> 
One of the main things that I came across was a lot of hate towards the book packagers. Um, one of the things that we have kind of talked about is that, you know, humans have been trying to define what art is mm -hmm. forever. We're not going to do that here. We're not going to do that ever, probably. Nope. What AI creates may or may not be art. We're not here to make a decision on that. A lot of people, however, do feel that stories that come out of book packagers are not art. They are cheap, kitschy objects that deserve to burn. And a lot of people are very self-righteous about this I just, belief. I'm going to go ahead and, and put this out there as somebody that has spent an excessive amount of time crying over fan fiction. <laughs> you're wrong. And in fact, a lot of the works that draw on existing IP are better than the garbage you can buy in stores that are totally written by individual people. Um, so just FYI, don't get up on your high horse unless you can remember how to, you know, get back down later before you're kicked off. Is that the same? No. Oh. <laughs> it is now. I think you had me there. I was like, oh, I never knew the full say. I can look it up. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Look, look. <laughs> if you if you accidentally stumbled on the whole saying, that would be fantastic. That would be hilarious. Before you get bucked off, buckaroo. <laughs> it just says to get off your high horse. Okay, whatever. Okay, so. I like mine better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> before you get bucked off. <laughs> so a lot of people feel that it's kind of belying why people write to begin with, why people sit down and want to create things. And another one of the things that people do know about book packaging, they know about that, uh, that author whose name is escaping me that you were talking about and that she was the subject of a predatory contract with those people. They did. She did not understand. She was 17. She didn't understand the, the contract that she was getting into. She had no clue. And then she took the fall for everything that went yeah. wrong. So there. caveat vish one, not, I want to say this okay. one, not, um, yeah, it was really tragic. I really do think that, I mean, she was 17. She didn't have any concept. I don't even know. She didn't have a good agent at the very least, let alone potentially any agent. Um, she eventually became a lawyer and I don't think that that was an accident. <laughs> no, I 100, I, they, they pushed her to finish and like she grabbed content so that she could deliver something. And assumed that an editor would do something. Yeah. But again, no. No. Yeah, it was awful. Turns out that the book packager problem is just editors not doing anything. <laughs> well, or, or not having editors on or not staff. not having editors at all. Yeah. Staff your editorial department. It's the same sort of criticism that we hear about superhero movies, right? They're like, oh, it's, it's paint by numbers. There's no, like, creativity going on here. And yet, I don't know about you, I cried in Avengers Endgame. Absolutely. I'm not afraid to admit no. it. Like, it still tugs on your fucking heartstrings, so who cares? I don't get it. Like, the okay, so the thing about book packaging is that it is more along the lines of writer's rooms for TV, like we said, or even movies, honestly. Exactly. yeah. But that stuff's still art. Like, it's still, it can, I mean, it can be shitty. It can be good or shitty. But, like, if you're going into something that you care about, and that's one of the things that's like, hey, maybe you just really like this IP and you want to write for it, which is what happens with fan fiction writers. You, you go in loving something, you're going to do right by it. You're going to try to do right by it. Like, just go, oh, go away and stop judging. I think there's People. also an element Gatekeepers. here and i'm sorry to always bring it back to sexism or discrimination against women. young women yeah. but and it's not all young women a lot no. of these people a lot of it is just for young people but the majority of it is for young women and people just hate the things that young women like also i think there's a lot of hatred for things that young people like mm -hmm. that's absolutely correct and there's hatred for things that make a lot of money that aren't you know high art but not everything has to be high art i don't want to watch interstellar every day I'm, i'll watch criminal minds every day sure i mean like consider the f again not that interstellar is necessarily high art but it's higher than criminal minds well you're not wrong i mean a <laughs> sorry lot, criminal minds and a lot of you this, know who you are a lot of, right you have your audience yeah. um you're doing fine crying doing all great. the way to the bank yeah right it serves different purposes mm -hmm. You can have a gourmet seven course meal and it's great, but you don't want that every fucking day. Like sometimes you just a bowl of cereal or something like yeah. you want something that is your comfort food or your comfort like content, your com your comfort show or your media or whatever. You want your formulaic crime drama. You want the rom-com. You want 
something that just makes you feel a thing and mm-hmm. you want a certain thing and you know where to go to get that. Like, we, I don't need to read fucking Waiting for Godot. Like, I won't. I won't read War and Peace every day. I won't read... Ulysses. Yeah. Like, oh, God. <sighs> but anyway, so one of the main things that I really came away from this research with is how much people dislike the fact that they are profitable and a lot of it smacked of just there was a definite undertone of kind of snobbiness as though oh i would never read one of those things but again like a lot of very very popular books come from these we would call them content mills if they were digital media but they're books so that we call them book packagers a lot of this content is fine it's fine I don't, I can't get mad. And again, we're not going to legislate what art is here. We can't. And we won't. Like It's silly. Gatekeeping is shitty. Yeah, absolutely. Don't steal. Gatekeeping otherwise is shitty. Yes, 100% agree. I didn't have a ton other than that. Um, it's kind I, of a straightforward topic for I me. I will say, yeah, right. I will say that um, I watched an interview um, oh, yeah. as we were doing this research. Let's... So Matt Baer, I think the executive director of the Book Manufacturing Institute, they're in their 90th year this year as a trade institution. It's like their 90th anniversary. And this is sort of where I was. I got some of my information. Um, it's it's an interview from whatthethink.com. It was talking about how like one of the industries that was part of the big boom during the pandemic and part of it not, wasn't even necessarily just the need to get content out. It was the the need to get the correct amount of content out. Um, so people that just panic produced now have all of these books in warehouses that they can't do anything with um and so like book packagers have a lot of knowledge from different industries because they work with a lot of different people and they have a lot of in-house knowledge so a lot of publishers uh started forming up additional contracts because of that it's a general thing i think um why you would work with any contractor is just stuff that you don't normally do and ultimately as some do like penguin and simon and schuster they purchased book packagers so that they would have the ability to run in-house ips and ghostwriters for these lines but like if you're not sure you want to do that um then you wait you outsource to other areas until you know how you want to do something and you want to do it sustainably or what figure out your your program what works what doesn't work that makes perfect sense to me but i am worried because a lot this is a lot of like new writers Mm -hmm. or even writers that are trying to shift their career trajectory right and they're gonna get impacted i think this will be impacted by ai specifically that's a good point yeah like because st- it's a lot of like hitting a word count on an outline that already exists yeah. which is what ai does better than other things yeah. or something that ai does better than it does other things. so like so some of the first stuff like like uh wizard chef or whatever and mm-hmm. then you see a lot of magical baking like the first few might be totally individual like mm-hmm produced again it's about ethical consumption like if you can get access to those books in such a manner that you can train your algorithm on them Mm -hmm. then you're gonna do it so it's gonna be interesting i think seeing that there's there's legalities playing out right now um and i think i'd added some additional maybe context in our ai transcript episodes we might want to pull those in just for this purpose but sure um, sure sure yeah i'll pull that into the show notes and link to the ai transcript so there's um some some court cases in the uk Mm -hmm. that have already gone through and they're just moving slower here and it's just about like midgard and like the legality of the training content and um pretty sure it's called midgard um midgard ai it's one of the art programs the journey I am, you are almost certainly correct. So Midjourney. <laughs> Midgard, Midgard is the is, Norse, is, is Norse, the Norse word, word for, for our world. Our world. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. No, I mean, I was about to say, like, is there a new one? Because that's a cool No, oh, name. it's an AI drone. All right. So Midgard, the AI drone, not <laughs> Midjourney, the AI art so program. Things are being legislated right now. And that's okay. what I think we need to just be concerned about. And I think that will impact the, the way that. AI grows and Mm -hmm. um, how much or how little it actually does hurt our industry and our people is how 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 ethical we are in implementing it. There are a lot of um, book publishing brands, I would say, that don't consider themselves book packagers. I'm thinking of like the Star Trek novels brand or the magic novels or like the, you know, World of Warcraft novels, like Mm -hmm. those novelizations of those larger IPs that I think don't consider themselves book packagers and actually probably don't work on necessarily the same outline structure, but, you know, effectively... Very similar. (laughs) Very similar. And I wonder if they will probably be more impacted because they are hiring individual writers for something that could not necessarily need an individual writer. 
Um, I wonder if that will be kind of like that mid-tier publisher that will have even more problems with it. Because I feel like book packagers will be pretty open with saying, hey, A, I can do it cheaply. And that's kind of our thing. So we'll be fine with it. Whereas like some of these other more emotionally charged IPs, I could say, might have a bit more of a backlash. I think it's less like the cookbooks and the photography books and the, the counterfeit, but it's more like Sweet Valley High, those series novels like that, especially the young adult novels that are going to see an impact first. Yeah, I think so too. I am concerned though. I remember my brother buying like all the, I think it was War, World of Warcraft novels. And I don't know what the plots were, but I can't imagine they were that original. You know what I mean? Like I, I worry about a lot of, writers just trying to make a living writing because again as you're saying some of them are coming up um and this is just something that you know book packagers are just like hey we'll hire you to write a book and then you have a book under your belt and you can leverage that to maybe get another job writing a different type of book and then maybe you then will have time to write the book that you've had in your head and your heart forever and you know, as you said, it's just like, it's also just a profitable business model that is books, that is storytelling, that is something that's probably enjoyable to do. I mean, book packagers get a lot of hate. They're probably like, kind of side eyeing it. Like, why are you mad at us? It's books is having fun. Like, this is great. There's probably some fallout here that we're not anticipating because there always is. But my guess is that the biggest fallout is going to be a lot of up and coming writers just not being able to break into the industry in this avenue and this avenue has been really prolific so it'll be a pretty big loss did you have a key coder for us for today <laughs> yes yeah, staff your editorial departments people are like what's this is an ongoing problem if they can't spot plagiarism you're fucked later yeah and yeah. regardless of whether you take legal repercussions you take a hit to your reputation absolutely Thank you for listening to the Ink Sync. I have been Annie. I'm Kaylee. And you can find all of our socials. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. Uh, join us on Substack where we have our transcripts made by the lovely Kaylee. Why, thank you, my dear. You can yeah. also buy us a coffee on you can, Kofi. You can buy us a coffee on Kofi. And you have. we also have a tip jar in our link tree. Uh, we also have links for where you can support us if you listen on Spotify. If you want to support us on Substack, if you really, really love Kaylee's writing. <laughs> I think I'm charming. <laughs> I think you're very mom, funny. Mom always said so. I think you're very funny <laughs> and Thanks. very smart, which is the main thing that my mom always says about you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Back at you, Annie, 100%. You, I'm only as smart as you wrote me to be. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, and you can find the links to all of those, including all of the ways that you can listen to our podcast on your favorite podcast app on our link tree, which you can find wherever you found this podcast. Thank you for listening.